Добрый день, дорогие участники, гости лекции. Я рад, что вы пришли в эту аудиторию. Наша сегодняшняя речь будет выходить на английском. So I switched into English. On behalf of the Russian International Affairs Council, I welcome all of you here. So the, the council continues its educational activity in parallel with the expertise we do and analytical work we have. Uh, yesterday we had quite fruitful, I'd say, a round table on um, transportation uh, in the Arctic region, particularly in the Bering Strait. Uh, not only uh, transport issues, but also ecological uh, concerns uh, of uh, Russia and the United States. And uh, we are honored and pleased that it was not uh, one way road, uh, the discussion. Uh, but we, had uh, experts uh, from United States and Canada. And uh, today we have um, open lecture and uh, free discussion, I would call it like this, uh, with um, Andrew Hartzik uh, and uh, Henry Huntington. Uh, well, um, I think that uh, we have the, the, the titles of your presentations, um, but I think it could be a bit wider since we don't have um, any slides, we could spend a bit more time to explain it in words. Uh, and um, we had a wide uh, uh, internet audience, so that doesn't mean that we are alone here in oh, this space. Wow, okay. So we we'll have a, a web translation while we can. Uh, and uh, we believe that it will help us to have a wider coverage of this event. Great. I stop here and um, pass the word to to Andrew? Okay. Okay. All right. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for having us here. It's, um, it, this has been my first trip to Moscow, and it um, will not be my last. It's, uh, it's really been lovely, and um, I very much appreciate all the um, feeling so welcome here. Um, so I work for a nonprofit conservation organization based in Anchorage, Alaska. It's called Ocean Conservancy, and um, one of the things, that, one of the issues we are concerned about at, at Ocean Conservancy is um, increasing vessel traffic in the Arctic waters, um, and we're concerned about making uh, vessel traffic safer, uh, reducing conflicts, and reducing impacts. Um, to the extent that we can. And uh, we recognize that the, um, there are instruments, international instruments, like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the Polar Code that provide a very strong framework, uh, a starting place. Uh, but we also think it's possible to do more to reduce impacts and prevent maritime accidents um, and conflicts in that region. Um, of course, Arctic vessel traffic is still at relatively low levels compared to other places in the world. Uh, but I think being proactive and getting out ahead of the problems um, and establishing best practices now before traffic grows is, is the best policy. Um, so I, I'm going to focus on the, the Bering Strait as a region where the United States and Russia share common interests. Um, and because it's an important pinch point, it's the, the only um, maritime passage between the Pacific and the Arctic. Um, and if there's vessels traveling on the uh, northern sea route uh, or on the Northwest Passage, all of those vessels eventually have to pass through the Bering Strait to get through to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and I'm also going to talk about the Bering Strait because it's an area um, of real interest to, um, to people in the United States. I think I, I'm from Alaska, and uh, Alaskas ha Alaskans have a, um, an affiliation with the Arctic, but I think more broadly in the contiguous United States, uh, people don't always recognize uh, the United States as being an Arctic nation. But when you talk to them about the Bering Strait, um, something resonates, um, and they they really get that it's an important place. Um, so the question is why people care about the Bering Strait, and I think um, there are some 
pretty easy answers. It's, um, it's home to uh, incredibly iconic species, uh, you know, whales, walruses, seals. Uh, there are aggregations of marine seabirds there that gather in the thousands. Um, in the south of St. Lawrence Island, in, in certain times of the year, you have almost the entire population of spectacled eiders that gather in, in this, this place. So uh, it's clearly a very important place for its ecology. Uh, and it's also a very important place because um, it's, it's used still by um, indigenous people for hunting and fishing, and, and those people depend on having a healthy and functional uh, marine environment, um, not only for as a source of food, but also as a, a um, pillar of their culture. Um, so, I, I think for all of those reasons, you know, the the fact that it's so important ecologically, the fact that it's um, People live there. It's it's uh, an important place for their culture. It's a, this incredible migration corridor. Um, you know, just as ships have to travel through that narrow strait, so do all the animals that migrate um, between the Pacific and the Arctic. Um, so all of that means that this is a very important place, and it's a place that that really captures um, people's imaginations. So what we want to avoid are um, maritime accidents that. Uh, diminish the ecosystem functioning in that place. Um, so this could happen with uh, a fuel spill. Alaska is um, infamous as the site of the Exxon Valdez uh, fuel spill, uh, oil spill, but it doesn't need to be a big tanker. It can also be, um, we've, we've had accidents or near misses with um, other types of vessels, and now there's also increasing um, tourism in the Arctic, so there will be more cruise ships going up there, um, and it's, it's certainly not out of the question to an, imagine an accident with a, with a tour vessel where you'd have not only um, impacts to the e ecosystem from you know, potential fuel spill, but certainly um, the potential for great loss of life because this is a remote and cha challenging area uh, and, and search and rescue um, would be difficult and you know at least right now we are not well equipped. Um, so so far um, you know I, I think we have not had a, a, a big accident like that in the Arctic um, but that's not a reason to kind of rest easy. I think it's important to be proactive. Uh, and there's probably no one single solution that's going to take care of all of the possible problems in, in the region in, in terms of increasing vessel traffic. Um, so I think what we need to do is look at a suite of measures that range from um, international to domestic and, and try and put together different pieces to address the problem. Um, so one of, one of those pieces, of course, is, um, like I mentioned before, the Polar Code uh, that will go into effect in January of 2017. And that um, contains provisions and standards, or at least reinforces provisions and standards um, for vessels that travel in the polar regions. It would apply um, throughout the Arctic uh, in, in designated waters under the Polar Code and the Antarctic, for that matter. Uh, so it's, uh, that kind of sets a, a floor for vessels traveling in the Arctic. But importantly, it, it does not apply to all vessels. It's restricted. Uh, so there are some vessels that will not be uh, covered by the Polar Code. And of course, the Polar Code does not cover all um, potential environmental or safety issues. It's, it's a good start, but we need to do more. Um, so, the, like I said, the Polar Code covers the entire Arctic region, uh, and I think that's one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle would be um, international law that applies just to specific places in the Arctic. And there are tools uh, available through the International Maritime Organization where you can really target protections. Uh, one of those tools is called um, Areas to be Avoided. 
and it's just like the name sounds. Uh, it's a an outline that ships uh, should not enter. So um, last last year, the International Maritime Organization um, adopted a set of areas to be avoided um, in the Aleutian Islands, a little bit further south than the Bering Strait. But it basically created a 50 mile buffer around most of those islands and left open only a few passes to get through. And the idea was that you wanted to keep the vessels as far away as possible from those dangerous, uh, dangerous waters, um, both to prevent the, the chance of a grounding and um, if something went wrong, if there was a loss of power, it would give responders much more time to get to the boat and um, you know, to set up some sort of tow line or whatever the case may be, um, a lot more time than if the boat had been just a few miles offshore. Um, so it's uh, kind of a common sense safety type measure. So I think measures like that could be um, put in place in the Bering Strait region as well. Uh, and in fact, our US Coast Guard is evaluating, uh, they're studying options for the Bering Strait and that's one of the options that they're studying. Uh, another one is putting in place a specific uh, vessel traffic lane, uh, which is kind of the other side of the coin from an area to be avoided. Uh, instead of saying you cannot go into this area, it says you must stay within this lane. Um, and I think that uh, is another possibility, and, and it, it might be that you need both. Um, to set up a, a traffic lane to increase the predictability of, of traffic, but also to set up areas to be avoided so that if vessels do have to deviate from that lane due to ice conditions or weather conditions, uh, they know that there are specific areas that they should not go. Um, so both of those are examples of site-specific protections that could be applied through international law. And then I mentioned too that another piece of the puzzle would be domestic law. And in the United States, we have um, laws like the Clean Water Act and the Oil Pollution Act. And those give us tools to um, regulate vessels under US jurisdiction to ensure that they have um, oil spill response plans in place. And then there are also um, flexible provisions that we're just now starting to really make use of. Um, and those provisions can help us put in place communication systems, uh, for example, automated, automated identification systems that help us track where vessels are, help us see whether there's a vessel in distress. Uh, and again, this is another tool that gives us more time to respond in advance. Uh, if there is some sort of problem. Um, and those systems are already in place in, in some parts of the Arctic, in most parts of the, the U.S. Arctic, so I think we're, we've made um, great progress there. Uh, there's also the potential to expand those systems and to make them a little more powerful by um, using them for two-way communication. Um, so vessels in the area might be able to communicate directly with um, indigenous people who are hunting in small boats uh, to avoid collisions. Or, um, for example, you might be able to identify where certain ice hazards are or where an aggregation of marine mammals are and use this system to um, ensure that vessels steer clear of those particular areas. And then I think um, maybe a further evolution of that system could be used um, to combine that with an idea with the idea of an area to be avoided so that you could have dynamic areas to be avoided or dynamic protected areas that would shift in time and space um, for example uh, if, if you wanted to have a, an area to be avoided associated with an ice edge and that ice edge is moving you can um, create that so I think that that is not in place now and there's um, not well-defined tools to do it, but I think that is kind of something that we could uh, look forward to in the future. And hopefully the way technology has been advancing, it wouldn't be too many years from now when that would be um, possible. Um, 
I'll just mention one more mitigation measure, um, and that could be, again, enforced under domestic law is pre-placement of um, emergency response assets. So uh, the idea would, would obviously be to try and prevent an accident if at all possible, so you have all these other tools to do that, but if an accident does happen, you need to be prepared and ready for it. So um, figuring out where to place equipment like booms and towing packages and things like that becomes very important in ensuring that you have um, committed to actually putting those, paying for those things and putting them in place um, would be a, another important step. And then um, finally, I think there's, you know, as I talked about the dynamic areas to be avoided, I think there's also room to be, um, to do more with, with communication systems using electronic navigation aids that would replace uh, expensive in the water buoys and other infrastructure doing that electronically and um, you know, saving money and allowing uh, the aids to be in the water all year long, even if there's ice, uh, I think that's another possibility for the future, something that's already starting to happen but you know, can probably be used more in the area um, to keep mariners and indigenous people who use that area safer. Um, so I, th I think that that's kind of all I have, um, but the, the main idea is, again, that there is no one single solution to increasing safety. It will take a, a, a suite of different measures to, to make it happen. Okay. okay, thank you, Andrew. And um, so we're happy to have uh, around this table two more speakers, uh, uh, Scott Heidemann, an international Arctic director at the Future Charitable Trust, and uh, Louis Porter, from uh, Oceans North Canada. Uh, so because when we started, I introduced the, the, the team of uh, uh, for speakers. Uh, and um, so if, don't, if you don't mind, we will follow consequently and I will ask uh, Scott to, oh, to, okay. to make a short introduction. I should do this. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Timur. And I apologize to all of you for being late. Um, but I understand when you live in Moscow, you always have an excuse. You can just say traffic, <laughs> even though we walked here. Okay. Um, I was hoping to show you some maps, but I thought I, I will instead, I will challenge you to use your imagination. Um, I thought when I thought about um, what to talk about tonight, I tried to pick something a little bit interesting that illustrates um, uh, how important, uh, illustrates the way in which cooperation between Arctic countries, including the United States and Russia, uh, can play out. So to use your imagination, uh, let's uh, imagine you're looking down at the top of the globe to the North Pole, and, um, and, and uh, you, you're zoomed up way up like a Google map that you can imagine, mm -hmm. and uh, um, the uh, the land masses that surround the Arctic Ocean are from five countries. You know your coastline very well, of course. Russia's a very long Arctic coastline. Then there's Alaska, and, and moving west, there's Alaska. And Canada, which also has a long coastline with thousands of islands. Greenland, and then uh, Spitsbergen, uh, which... Uh, and so, um, if you draw 200 miles, 200 nautical miles out from those five coastlines, which... Um, of course, then the area of ocean that's left around the North Pole is high seas, international waters. So by definition, beyond 200 nautical miles uh, under the law of the sea treaty. So um, uh, that area, imagine um, until very, very recently, through all of human history, has been permanent ice. When in English, well, when I started working on the Arctic, scientists still called it permanent ice in English, and they no longer call it permanent ice. They call it um, uh, multi-year ice because it's not; it's proving not to be permanent. And so, from the time when uh, Homo sapiens first started leaving uh, Africa, the coastal plains of southern Africa, and migrating uh, to all the other places in the world. This area has been has had multi-year ice, had permanent ice, until very very recently. In 2007, 40 percent of this area was um, no longer with permanent ice. Was ice-free in September, at the end of the Arctic summer, 
also in 2012. Every year, I would show you a really nice graph. You can imagine it. Every year, the uh, the amount of ice changes due to um, the annual variations. But the overall trend is very clear in the last um, 20 years that uh, the ice is melting. So um, that 200 mile uh, limit that I described has never mattered to anybody except a few uh, lawyers and experts. Because uh, if you think of it as a red border or a red line drawn 200 miles, it was always under ice. All of a sudden it matters because in the high seas, the way international law works, um, fisheries is allowed unless countries come together and make an agreement. And so uh, in the high seas, it's, it's, it's called unregulated fishing and, we try to, and countries try to frown on it, but in fact it's how fisheries has been pioneered all around the world through all of human history. Well, what about the Arctic? Is there, there's a danger in continuing to do it that way, which is that fishing fleets can show up before the scientists actually understand what's there. And uh, commercial fishermen, I support commercial fishing and I have many uh, friends who are commercial fishermen. They're very, very, very good hunters. Humans are incredibly good at this. <laughs> and so the fishermen are so much better at finding the fish than scientists that uh, by the time scientists show up, they also are very good specialists. They study what's left. But in fact, you don't actually know what was there originally and how, what, how, did, it, how did those fish support the overall ecosystem. So um, the, um, the question was, is, uh, can we be smart enough this time to actually uh, establish through scientific study what's actually up there? before fishing fleets sh magically show up and start fishing. Um, the, um, the place, uh, because, um, also because of the way the Law of the Sea Treaty works, the five coastal nations that I mentioned have special rights and responsibilities as the coastal nations, but not exclusive when it comes to fisheries. And so in fact, it's perfectly permissible for uh, countries from, in, from India, from China, from other places to go in and prosecute these, uh, these fisheries. Fortunately, it hasn't happened yet. And so this is a rare case uh, in environmental issues where um, we actually have a chance to prevent a problem. Um, many times in my line of work, uh, you're going from crisis to crisis and trying to um, trying to fix a problem. I used to tell my children, they would ask me, what, I do, what do I do for a living? And I said, well, uh, what I do for a living is I put my hands out and people come and put broken eggs in it and say, can you make something out of that? Mm -hmm. Because the environmental problems usually are so severe that we're scrambling to catch up. So this is a very fun issue to work on. Um, and, uh, and to fast forward, um, what ended up happening was um, when um, um, we and others like us were able to start talking to um, first uh, both the fishing fleets and the governments and the scientists in those countries. It turned out that none of the five coastal countries really wanted to start fishing there. In other words, each country, like the Russian fishing fleet, the Alaska fishing fleet, plenty of places to fish in their own waters. And they actually haven't even finished exploring. Russia hasn't even finished exploring its own waters. The United States has very few uh, surveys of fisheries in its waters. And so, um, so that's good because you don't have an industry that's, uh, and you don't have jobs at stake yet. Also another novel, um, uh, a nice novelty for environmental issues. Um, and, um, and when talking to scientists, they also acknowledge that they have almost no knowledge about the, bio the biology of this region. Of course, yes, they know a lot um, about the Arctic region in general and how things work, but most of the studies are along the coastlines for obvious reasons. It's really difficult to get to this high seas area. Um, and so um, I won't go through all of the details, but um, we fast forward to July 2015 when the five coastal nations all agreed, the Arctic coastal nations all agreed that uh, they signed a voluntary policy statement called the Arctic Fisheries Declaration. It essentially said, we agree that science needs to take place and that it's premature to allow fisheries to start here. Uh, and so we are now, we're stating as a voluntary policy that we will not allow our individual fishing fleets to, um, to start fishing there. 
And we also acknowledge that other nations have an interest in this area, again, because you can't be exclusive under uh, international law. Just because you're the coastal nation, you don't get to set the rules for the high seas area adjacent to your waters. Um, agree that uh, we need to talk to other interested nations and try to get them to um, come up with, uh, see if they'll agree to the same idea. And so um, next week in Washington, D.C. is the second negotiating session for 10 countries, the five Arctic coastal nations, plus China, Japan, South Korea, Iceland, and the European Union. And that's actually the issue that they're all dealing with, um, how to... Um, is there a way to um, come up with a binding international agreement that would say, let's not start fishing in this high seas area unt until some future point when we have adequate science and we have management measures that tell us, yes, we could, there's things to fish and we could do them in an ecologically sound manner. And um, I thought it was, it was a bit ironic that first negotiating session was in December 2015 and it was the exact same week that um, 190 nations were meeting to talk about climate change in Paris, and yet um, uh, 10 countries, you know, had enough interest to send, you know, their B team diplomats um, to uh, to Washington to talk about this fisheries issue. And it, and I was reflecting that um, this this is a perfect example of an unexpected problem that climate change. Um, uh, um, causes sort of a uh, um, sort of a bank shot in a pool or an unexpected thing, and that we probably will likely have many more these kinds of things that we weren't really thinking. Wow, why are we talking about fisheries in this high seas area? So, um, and finally, my final point is um, it, it was it's been an interesting issue for me as well because, of course, um, when you come when it comes to international cooperation, ultimately. It's the nations themselves, the governments themselves, that have to talk government to government. And yet around the edges, there's been a very powerful role for NGOs, um, including the uh, Russian International Affairs Council. It's actually played a very important role. Uh, we had roundtables uh, and discussion among experts, not necessarily among government people, um, comparing notes about the issue. How are you looking at it? What do you think is happening? We've had. Um, representatives of the Russian fishing fleet um, at many meetings around the world talking about this and of course we've had many many scientists and so it's, uh, it's uh, as an aside I think it's also been an interesting uh, way in which um, other actors in addition to governments can have influence and can have a say about uh, about policy and with that I think I'll conclude and thank you very much okay thank you Scott and uh, I, I want to pass over to Henry Huntington uh, senior officer at the Sorry? Uh, so it's the opposition senior officer at the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here, and thank you for all, all for coming. Um, the theme of the evening is on international cooperation in the Arctic, and I'd like to talk about something that I've been involved with for over 20 years, which is the, the Arctic Council, um, and specifically the various assessments that the Arctic Council has made over that period. Um, I've been involved in at least nine of them, and I think I've been involved in more of them than anyone else in the world. So this is still my opinion, but at least I have some basis and experience in this to, to draw on. Um, so it's interesting to think about how these assessments reflect cooperation, both in preparing the assessment and in the influence that the assessments have afterwards. Um, you know, just to list some of them, the, the AMAP assessment report in 1997, there was a report on Arctic flora and fauna a few years later, the Arctic Human Development Report, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, um, the Arctic Ocean Report, the Oil and Gas Assessment, the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment, and in preparation now, the Adaptation Actions for a Changing Arctic Report, which has a few different different sections. So they've covered all kinds of different topics around the Arctic. Um, if we think about them in terms of their sort of scientific merit, some have been very, very good. If you look at that first AMAP assessment in 1997, that was very high quality scientific work and, and very strong and I think 
set a very nice standard for work on environmental contaminants around the Arctic. Similarly, the, the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment was published in 2005, but it continues to be cited by, by people because it did such a good job of summarizing the key issues about, about climate in the Arctic. Um, you can also think about it in terms of, say, the, the influence that they've had on policy. Again, that first AMAP assessment report in 1997 played an instrumental role in leading to the Stockholm Convention on POPs, Persistent Organic Pollutants, in 2001. And so its influence on policy was very strong. And I'll come back to how it had that influence on policy. Uh, if we look at the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, very strong scientifically, but getting constructive policies on climate change has been very difficult. So the extent to which it's actually produced a, a good policy outcome is perhaps a little more debatable. If we look at the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, um, I don't know that that was the best scientific document ever, but it was very good at drawing attention to the questions of Arctic shipping and leading to things like the, the polar code that Andrew spoke about earlier. So I think it was very effective in catalyzing a lot of interest around a topic that until then had been largely ignored, or at least ignored at, a, at an international level. You know, Russia had paid an awful lot of attention to the Northern Sea Route internally, but not much had been done to, to pool the knowledge that we had about shipping all around the Arctic from, from the different countries. So I think some of the assessments have been very good at drawing attention that way. Some have been very good at, at achieving the science. Um, I'll come back to the policy questions in a moment. The other thing that's interesting to think about with these assessments, you can talk about them broadly as signs of international cooperation, but not every country contributes equally to each assessment. And we can see a lot of variation. That first AMAP assessment report, the US did a terrible job. If you look at many of the maps that they show of the contaminant levels around the Arctic, Alaska is a gray area. It's a blank. There's no information. Because the US could not be bothered to put, to put their information in. Other countries contributed a great deal and made, took it very seriously. For some reason, the US just didn't try. If you look at the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, the US led the effort, provided most of the funding. There were many lead authors involved in, in the different chapters and so on. It was a very strong effort. So you can see a huge variation. Um, and I think that's true for other countries as well. Some, some reports, some of these assessments, different countries have been very uh, active in, and other ones they aren't. And I think there are a variety of reasons for that. Some topics are of more interest to some countries than others. That's fair. Some, country, some issues touch on things that make countries nervous about national interests. The oil and gas assessment is a good, a good example. There were sort of a... Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Electronic interference. Um, but if we look at, uh, the, we're on the questions of why some countries are interested. Some, if you take a topic like oil and gas, this is, some countries see this as threatening. If the report says, well, oil and gas is very dangerous in the Arctic, but countries are relying on Arctic oil and gas, take the state of Alaska. Oil and gas is extremely important for the state's well-being. With gas oil prices the way they are now, the state is having some, some real trouble and doesn't need an assessment that says, oh, this is not a great thing. So there's a lot of sensitivity about some of the, the topics that are there. Um, it's also a question of sort of expertise and funding. Sometimes you, countries have the experts to contribute to a certain topic. They have the funding to support those experts. Sometimes they don't. So it can be a little random. The other thing that I think is essential is leadership. Some of the assessments have had really good leaders who've done a lot of work and have been very effective in encouraging other countries and encouraging experts to take part and getting them to be productive contributors. Other ones just have not had that benefit. Whoever is leading it either doesn't have the time, doesn't have the effort, doesn't have the, the skills and the personality to be an effective leader. And so having 
having effective leadership both within your country and to work in, in other countries and encourage contributions as, a, as an essential part. Now back to this question of policy. So the Arctic Council has been very good at generating these assessments and helping advance the, our understanding of these issues and public awareness of many of these topics and so on. In my opinion, at least, it has been far less successful as a group in promoting a good policy response. So I mentioned that the, the first AMAP assessment in 1997 helped produce the Stockholm Convention on POPs a few years later. That was not because the Arctic Council took action. It was because Canada took that report and played a very strong leadership role in the, the international negotiations on POPs and really used the Arctic information to make the case that these were pollutants being used in low latitudes that were finding their way into the Arctic and accumulating. And that this was a serious global problem if things that were being used in the tropics are being found in high levels in the Arctic and that global action was needed. Canada was very effective in delivering that message using the information generated by the Arctic Council, but the Arctic Council played a very small, if any, policy role on that. And I think that's true elsewhere. If we look at the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment, it's been a big help in getting things like the Polar Code um, enacted. I think it's played a role in encouraging us to have discussions like we had yesterday here about Arctic shipping. But those actions have, been take, have largely taken place outside of the Arctic Council. And so a lot of people look at to the Arctic Council and say, well, this is a great policy forum. I don't think history bears that out. I think it's a terrific forum for doing these assessments, for getting attention to a topic, for galvanizing people's energy, for providing a forum where we can pool our information and advance what we know. Beyond that, I think the policy things tend to be carried out in, in other places. And I think that's worth thinking about if we think about the directions for the Arctic Council, what it can achieve, and what we can expect from the Arctic Council. Uh, so if we think about international cooperation in the Arctic, again, maybe it's to, the one way to say it is it, it's a safer area, it's a, a, an easier area to collaborate to say, what can we do to, to pool our knowledge? What can we do in science? It can be a harder thing to decide that we want to figure out how everybody's national policy compares with this particular issue and what we want to do. Or there may be topics where it's just not appropriate to be discussing that with all eight countries around the table. Scott had mentioned the, the negotiations on fisheries in the, in the Arctic Ocean. Fisheries are not in the Arctic Council, but the illustration is, is the same. Finland and Sweden have no Arctic Ocean territory. They have no real interest in this. There's no point in trying to have a discussion with countries in the room that really have no interest in this. It makes much more sense to talk with the countries that have a direct interest. If we're talking about Arctic shipping and the Bering Strait, again, it doesn't make that much sense to include countries in the Atlantic. To include Russia and, and the US is obvious, to include Canada makes sense because of the Northwest Passage. Beyond that, you don't need to have an eight nation discussion to discuss something that's on the border of just two countries. So I think thinking about where the appropriate places are to address the, the, the policy needs is a, is a good thing. So to wrap that up, um, I think the Arctic Council has been a great forum for international cooperation in many areas, particularly in the assessments, and I'm biased because that's where most of my work has been. Um, but I think on the policy side, there are other, other venues that are more effective for international cooperation, building on the work that's been done under the Arctic Council. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And uh, I think we're happy to have the majority of speakers from the United States since the United States is holding the chairmanship uh, in the Arctic Council, and uh, I believe uh, the participants will have some questions and uh, challenge you with, the, with these <laughs> questions concerning the American chairmanship. Uh, but um, we all know that uh, the greatest powers uh, in the Arctic uh, are the countries with uh, the longest coastline, it's Canada and Russia, and we're happy to have full report from Canada. So the floor is you. Thank you for not forgetting about Canada. <laughs> um, also, I'd just like to echo the sentiments of my colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much uh, for organizing this event. Um, I have a quick question, though. I know there's no uh, PowerPoint, 
But can I, I have a, a 30 second clip of a sound. Is that something I could play just from the computer? What I... Just from the normal speakers of the computer, no? Well, you want us to do it for you? You know, I, I, uh, <laughs> Scott, I can't, I, I cannot sound like a beluga whale or a beluga whale, so you'll have to do extra imagining. Um. <laughs> so it's all connected to, to the web translation that is why there's no, uh, yeah, okay. it doesn't work. Really sure, it, it's, up, it's up to you, of okay. course. Um, so I was asked to speak about the Canadian Arctic and its people um, very broadly. Um, and at first I would just say about myself that um, I've lived and worked in the Canadian Arctic um, as a marine mammal scientist and over the last seven years um, as part of Oceans North Canada as a director of policy um, and just in that period of time I've made over 50 trips to the Arctic um, for ranging from Labrador to the Beaufort Sea and many places in between. I live in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, the capital of Canada, and I also do a lot of government relations work. And so ultimately I've see, I see myself now as a bit of a bridge between the specific place itself, the people, and the parts of the country that are the centers of power. So I'm also hoping today to be a bit of a bridge between Canada and Russia um, and provide some places where uh, people in the room can connect to these, uh, to, can connect um, their issues and questions uh, to these two places. And because this is a completely uh, improvisational conversation, um, I would first just ask the room, if there are any specific questions about the Canadian Arctic that you hold, um, tell me and I will make sure that I, I cover them in my talk. So I'll, I'll, sh I'll be quiet for a few seconds to see if somebody says anything. Please use the microphone, because uh, we'll have the translation in this minute. Okay. Um, um, yesterday we had a chance to, 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 to see a discussion that was in your round table concerning um, shipping uh, through um, Northern Sealand. And that's why today I'm very interested to know whether it is active, the shipping across um, Western, Northwestern, North the Northwest Passage. Yes, the Northwest Passage. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I will. Uh, I've done a couple of talks on that uh, very subject, and so I will. Uh, I will come to that in the second half. So first, just about the the part of the, the Arctic in Canada. It is over forty percent of the landmass of Canada. It how it ha contains fifty three uh, Inuit communities. It encompasses 30% uh, of Canadian Ocean territory and very much defines Canada as an, as an Arctic nation. And yet, um, even to people in Canada, this region is fairly remote and fairly unknown, um, as are the people, the Inuit, who live across the Canadian Arctic. The government of Canada has a special relationship with the people of its Arctic, the Inuit. They signed these special agreements called land claims agreements and there are four of them that cover the entirety, every kilometer of the Canadian Arctic and, and all of its landmass. And these agreements effectively um, create a co-management regime between the people who have always lived and inhabited the Arctic and still rely on the Arctic um, for their present and future prosperity and, and give them special powers that um, no other government has given their indigenous peoples across the world. So I think it's important to first reflect on the fact that in the Canadian Arctic context, it's a people place, and the people who live there rely on the environment being uh, full of abundance so that they can continue to use that abundance to survive. So when you talk about the, the activities that happen in the Canadian Arctic, there are, of course, a few ways to think about this. First is are the, are the you know, the animals, the marine mammals, and the biology that uh, inhabit the north, which, much like the Russian and Alaskan Arctic, stand out when you think about the rest of the world. Uh, there are aggregations of the largest aggregations of beluga whales in the world are contained in the Canadian Arctic and West Hudson Bay. 
the largest aggregations of narwhal happen uh, each uh, sp early summer in the mouth of Lancaster Sound, the entrance to the Northwest Passage. Uh, in the summer months in the Beaufort Sea, the largest population of bowhead whales come to feed and reproduce. And what's important is that every place that there are a lot of animals, there are people. And that's not by accident. That's because the people know, uh, have relied on the abundance of the natural environment and that's why they inhabit these special spaces all along the coastline and many of the little passageways that ultimately make up the Northwest Passage. The federal government of Canada has done a number of evaluations um, that talk about, that look at the sensitivity of the region and nearly 50% of the Canadian Arctic has been, uh, is considered ecologically and biologically significant. Nearly 50% of the Canadian Arctic has been identified by Inuit also as ecologically and biologically significant. And yet, of course, all Arctic conversations, and at least in our, present, in our present days, people also think about uh, the economic potential of the region. And I think what's important to think about when you reflect on the special agreements that Inuit have with their federal government in Canada, the Crown, is that not only do they, they set up three basic principles. One is that they would like they would like the biological abundance of the, of the Arctic to remain in perpetuity so that they can continue to benefit from it. Two, they would like their culture to thrive. And three, they want and deserve a role in the 21st century economy. So I come to this point third because it's not to say that you have to choose between having a productive environment and an economic foundation for your life and your livelihood, quite the contrary. It's, in it's precisely in places that rely on that sustainable balance between the economy, sustainable, sustainable culture, and, and ab an abundant environment that adds up to what people think about as sustainable development. But of course, th that idea is, is not, um, was not created when the term was created. It's a, it's a logical concept in, in many ways. So industrial activity in the Arctic also includes uh, the perspectives of those who live there um, at all aspects of environmental assessments, whether they be for oil and gas, um, minerals, mineral development for mining, um, sh the shipping aspects of mining projects that require uh, transportation from, from the Arctic out of the region, um, or, or fisheries. And their special agreements connect to the federal uh, system of environmental assessment, so they they are homogenized, and so they one is not um, it's not one or the other; they are combined. So it, again, it sets up a, a very unique governance structure compared to any other place in the world, and also just any other place within Canada as a as a country. The current state of economic development in the Canadian Arctic is 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 not that robust. It's there's not m a lot happening. And a few years ago, there was more. But uh, broadly speaking, uh, the Western Arctic, the Beaufort Sea, the part that's closest to Russia, uh, has been the, the seen as the center of uh, oil and gas development, and with nearly 135 wells drilled uh, historically, uh, and lots of seismic testing that's gone on over the last 40 or 50 years. Whereas in the eastern part of the Canadian Arctic, you're more likely to see mines. Um, and currently, the potentially the largest uh, mining project ever in the Canadian Arctic, called the Mary River Mine on North Baffin Island, um, is in its final state. It's in sort of a, it's been in a prolonged period of environmental assessment, but it's nearing a, a conclusion in terms of uh, the rules being set out for what, how that mine will operate. And then, of course, there's the, the to go to your question. There is this idea of things that go in between the the, the Northwest Passage. So the Northwest Passage, of course, is a, and shipping in the Canadian Arctic, much like in the Russian Arctic, is both historic and emerging. You know, if you look at the, the place names of every strait and every island across the Canadian Arctic, you find names of a lot of Englishmen, <laughs> and, that, and that's because people brought boats there. If you go to traditional place names that predate those English names, you have another set of names, names that um, go back millennia. So. People have been there for a long time, and the passage is really a series of passageways which really distinguishes it um, from the Russian context. It's really, it's not a sort of a large marine mm -hmm. space. It's a network of nearly a thousand uh, islands in a very interesting archipelago. 
Um, and as a result, the passage is a passageway for humans, it's a passageway for vessels, it's a passageway for birds, fish, marine mammals. And it's helpful to think about the passage as, as a series of passages, at least for me, it helps to, to understand the fact that uh, you need to, any kind of governance structure, or any approach to shipping in this area needs to recognize that there are a lot of different types of things using the exact same places to get from one part of one place to another. And there is no separating them. So it's not, if you have a, a large open ocean area and you say, well, I'm gonna go here and I assume if I make enough noise, the whales will go over there. And that won't be a big deal. But if you have a, a small strait that's uh, 50 kilometers wide, then you don't have those options. So the, the Northwest Passage uh, as sort of, as an emerging place of interest is also part of Canada's sovereignty claims over its northern waters. It's an important, incredibly strategic area for the, the Canadian government and of course those who live there. And the re so recent history of shipping in the region is uh, quite different from the Russian context in the sense that it's been, it's, it, the numbers of vessels are quite low compared to what happens in the Northeast Sea Route. In 1980, there were three complete transits of the Northwest Passage and maybe 100 individual vessel movements from within the passage. Um, if you fast forward to 2014, you have 28 complete transits with nearly 300 intra-passage intra, uh, uh, movements. And what's important to think about that is, is the, the Canada, some countries encourage things and some countries discourage things, and that's not necessarily because one thing is right or wrong, but because people are ready for certain activities at certain times. So in Canada, Canada is not at a point where it's encouraging transit shipping through the Northwest Passage, precisely because Canada has two icebreakers that can actively service the area um, for most of the year. It has less than 3% of the Canadian Arctic is charted to modern standards. There is not a single port, deep water port in the entire space. And fourth, uh, there is an absolute paucity or a complete lack of supporting nautical infrastructure you know, um, that for mariners to rely on and to ship safely through. And of course, even though ice is, mo is receding, uh, as Scott said, it, is a, it, it comes and it goes. So in certain parts of the passage, you're seeing longer open water seasons. In some parts of the passage, you're seeing equally treacherous multi-year conditions. And you know, leading uh, ice specialists actually said that the most the treacherous time for shipping in Canada's Northwest Passage will be in the next decade, as the large multi-year ice that inhabits the high R part of Canada's Arctic starts to break up and flush through this set of straits. So the talk that we did, uh, that I did yesterday and this morning was about the idea of creating a set of integrated Arctic cor shipping corridors that would uh, help the Coast Guard keep vessels where they were best able to be serviced, uh, would factor in traditional Inuit use of the area, would factor in uh, seasonal and annual environmental considerations and, uh, and special areas, and would find the safest routes for mariners based on the prepared, the general preparedness of the region. So all this is to, to sort of to wind up here. What I think is really interesting about the Arctic and in many places in the world where humans have, where sort of modern human society hasn't fully uh, in, in immersed itself, is that there are opportunities, again, just like Scott said, to, to make new mistakes, to, to take policy challenges that we have made certain, we've done certain things with over human history or other parts of the world, and do it differently here, and to, and to learn um, from that we, if we could, if we could take back and not, you know, fish out key areas of the Grand Banks, we would. If we could go back and not bottom trawl along all of our coastlines, we probably would. So if we could go back and we could create areas of, uh, protect areas of special ecological and human importance so that those areas were permanent and so you could have sustainable development at the same time, we probably would. But the problem is oftentimes we may be 100 or two years, 100 years past those, those moments. I think the Arctic offers a special moment and in Canada it's a very unique um, time for its people, uh, for its wildlife, and for the government that uh, ultimately sets the rules. Thanks.
Okay, thank you, Louis. Uh, I think that we'll have uh, 20 minutes for questions, and uh, so we'll open the second part of our meeting. So, please, and please introduce yourself. Yeah, of course. My name is Konstantin Ugrovsky. I am Marine Program Coordinator for World Wildlife Fund Russia. My question for you, gentlemen, uh, do you see any lessons learned in the Antarctic? which we could, be, could be used for the Arctic. And it's not why. Thank you. You go ahead. OK. Uh, you want Any ideas? <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK. Uh, you want to go? Well, yeah. well I, I, will, I will give you some reasons why I think they are different. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by continents, all of which, all of the different countries of which have an interest. And the Antarctic, of course, is a continent where everyone has agreed we're going to, to stay out except for scientific purposes. So um, the, the Arctic Council um, that Henry talked about, I think, has kind of done a good job of assessing issues and problems, but they've, uh, those same Arctic nations have also agreed um, that there will not be any kind of similar treaty to the Antarctic. Um, they have stated in pretty clear terms that they think that the international norms uh, and, and uh, individual treaties that you know, are already in place are sufficient, uh, and there's no need for uh, something akin to the Antarctic. And I, you know, I think that's largely because of this, you know, reverse situation where you have countries ringing this ocean that all have interests at stake, and um, they're not willing to cede those interests just yet. Yes, get to me eventually. Oh, just. Uh, I think that's right. In many ways, the legal regimes are, and the geographic position are almost direct opposites. On the other hand, I think there perhaps one big thing from the Antarctic that would be nice to see in the in the Arctic, and that is the the uh, the sense of cooperation around research. And even during the height of the Cold War in the Antarctic, there was good collaboration back and forth. And I was in the worked in the Antarctic in 1982 and 83. A Russian scientist spent the winter at the South Pole, the U.S. station. U.S. scientists had visited Vostok station, the Russian station, and so on. This was, this was normal. It worked very well. Um, also, access everywhere around the Antarctic was open. Of course, neither the U.S. nor Russia recognizes any land claims in the Antarctic, so it's a little different. But I think there are some good examples of access and some ways to improve scientific access around the Arctic. Uh, we just learned yesterday about the, the efforts to build uh, an international station near Arkhangelsk. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. I was in Svalbard a few years ago. Again, Svalbard has a different legal regime, but there's a station from India, one from South Korea, one from Japan, one from China, all at the, the station at New Olesen. And it sounds like something similar is envisioned for the, the, the White Sea region. So that's terrific if we can build on this idea that, that science is a way to cooperate and, and work together. I think that's a lesson we can take from the Antarctic. And it's nice to see some, some signs of that going on in the Arctic. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, Louis. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add one quick point, which is uh, that I actually think that there's an opportunity potentially for both regions to help each other uh, in the sense that uh, over time, the, you know, the Antarctic area has standards for certain industrial activity that would be really well placed in the, in the North American, in the, the Arctic, specifically the transportation of heavy fuel oils um, and black carbon. And then there are other issues, as we've learned from Scott, that the Arctic, in terms of precautionary approaches to commercial fisheries, could, could certainly benefit uh, the continent of Antarctica. So I think the idea of exchanging uh, the best global practices against specific uh, industrial activity that are multinational in, um, in practice is also a, an interesting link between those regions where they can uh, um, to benefit one another. Thanks. Any more questions? Yes. My name is Babunika Mutani, and I'm a fourth grade 
graduate student at Moscow State University Institute of uh, Asian and African Studies. The thesis of my uh, diploma this year is China in the Arctic from 2008 in modern days, and I, disc and I tr tried to research uh, the policies, strategies, and interests of China in the Arctic. And uh, I have a question to Mr. Huntington concerning China's participate, participation within the Arctic uh, Council, because I know that in 2013 it finally gained uh, permanent observer status. And how does uh, China act itself within this Arctic Council? And anything you can say about um, the real importance of the Arctic for China and uh, especially shipping, transportation, um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's, a, it's a good question, and it's hard, it's hard to say, mm -hmm. especially in the Arctic Council context, because mm -hmm. the role of the observer countries is to sit and observe. Mm -hmm. the, there, if, if there's a table like this where the different the members of the Arctic Council are discussing things, China sits over there in the back. Backbench. Yeah, backbench. And so it's, it's hard to see. I mean, there, We've, we've had a, we had a meeting in Shanghai a little over a year ago, and many of the Chinese participants were still talking about how, how excited they were that they were members of the Arctic Council, that they were observers of the Arctic Council. And we were thinking, why? <laughs> but, okay, it's nice that you're there, but terrific. I'm, we're glad that you're excited, but what does it do? Um, I think it'll be interesting to see, with a little more time, whether China starts to, to find a way to contribute, I mean, to, to take part in these assessments and, and to do other things. Um, and it'll be interesting, I think, to see whether, how long China remains satisfied with this secondary backbench role. Um, the Scott had talked about the, the Central Arctic Ocean fisheries. There it's interesting that, I mean, again, their enthusiasm about the Arctic Council was that they they thought, well, this would be a great place to talk about it. Well, for a variety of reasons, the Arctic Council is a terrible place to talk about fisheries. And we were saying, why don't you have a diff different forum where you sit at the same table? Why do you want to take it to a place where you're in the back? And, and I just, gradually that seemed to sink in. I said, oh, well, we could be, we could, and I think it's important for China to be seen to be an important uh, country in the Arctic. So that, so that they're, in, they're included, so that they're not being left out. Um, it's funny, China even has a phrase, they describe themselves as a near-Arctic nation. So I think Manchuria is near to the Arctic, apparently, so take that, keep that in mind. Um, but I think that it's also a very interesting question of how they portray their interest. There's a lot of people, there's a, one uh, Chinese academic, Kai Sun, who talked about this and said, oh, the fear is that the Chinese are coming, the Chinese are coming. Iceland had been very nervous about the proposal for a very large investment by Chinese businessmen in Iceland. Mm -hmm. you know, Greenland has seen it as a chance to find funding for mining and so on, but they're not too sure. Norway's not, they have, well, they have their own issues over Nobel Prizes and things. Uh, so there's some concern. On the other hand, I think China would like to be seen as a good constructive contributor. They have an icebreaker. They, they take part in some of the, again, some of the scientific collaborations and so on. They'd like to be seen as a, as a partner. And I wonder if that's some of their motivation behind a strong interest in the Northern Sea Route. It's not yet clear whether the Northern Sea Route really is economically a great idea. But I think China doesn't want to miss that opportunity. And so where other countries might say, well, you know, we'll wait and see, China says, hey, here's a chance for us to, to become involved. and, and uh, Another Chinese academic, uh, Pan Min, she and I wrote a paper on China's role. Um, I'd be happy to get you a copy if you'd like. Um, but the idea was that this is a chance for China to, to participate in a cooperative way and, and essentially show their good intentions um, rather than creating the fear that somehow they're planning to come up and, and take over the Arctic. And I think they've been, you know, Kai Sun and others have been clear, they've been trying to be clear that despite some misstatements or mistranslations, they recognize that all the land in the Arctic is already part of a country. They're not coming up looking to claim Arctic territory because there's no Arctic territory left to be claimed. 
but I think some of the early the early messages from China made it sound like they were looking up to come to a place to <laughs> plant the Chinese flag. That's not what they're doing. And I think that, that message is getting through a little clearer. And I think the Arctic Council is a way for them to show that they're being cooperative. Mm -hmm. I think they're probably looking for more opportunities as well. If I can a bit contribute to, to this topic and share with you uh, my own uh, vision, a bit of geopolitical vision on this issue. Um, I think that uh, this activity of China is a trait of uh, rising power in, in the global arena. And it's um, the way how rising powers try to test their capacity to work in um, extreme conditions. Uh, whether it is uh, conflicts, uh, international conflicts or extreme climate conditions. <coughs> so here's uh, like a positive experience to work in very, um, very extreme conditions like uh, the North. The Arctic, uh, whether they can cope with this or not, and that makes uh, rising powers uh, proud of themselves as they as they can. It's a really interesting idea. We, a couple of us, some of us, were in uh, South Korea a couple of weeks ago, and I was having a similar thought that South Korea has an icebreaker. It is that now the mark of status that you're a you're a big maritime country <coughs> if you have an icebreaker. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is soon not to be a major power by that standard, but uh, you know, South Korea, Japan, uh, China all have icebreakers. They're all using them actively. So I think there's a, that's right, to show your capacity. Either you go to space or you go to the Arctic. So Just practically the same. There are some publications even uh, from within the political science uh, research uh, new spaces of uh, political activity, space and the Arctic. So you need to search for these publications. You'll see some uh, similar uh, way of thinking, I would say. Uh, OK. Yes, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Vladimir Prekin. I am from the Russian State University for the Humanities. Uh, my question would be, uh, what, um, uh, in your opinion, the prospects for a positive decision, positive for Russia, a decision in the United Nations on the uh, Lomonosov and uh, Mendeleev rich issues. Thank you. Well, actually, I'll give my opinion, and then Andrew, can you can tell me if I'm uh, if uh, completely wrong based on the law. Um, <laughs> but the what I find interesting because um, there's there's two major stories when you read the when you read the newspapers and watch television you know, all around the Arctic. There's all, there's um, the simple versions of the stories. Either it's uh, conflict in the Arctic, uh, either because the Chinese are coming or because the U.S. and Russia are having a dispute or whatever it is. Um, and then the other um, stories are about um, uh, cooperation. So it's always conflict or cooperation. And I get really tired of reading these stories because you just put them in one pile or the other and they don't often really tell you anything new. Um, and so, of course, uh, the, uh, the favorite conflict story in the press in the media is about uh, the delimitation of the continental shelf, as you're saying, and of course, um, uh, you know, planting the flag and doing this and doing that. And you can always, you know, you can sell newspapers. I know I'm dating myself by using that term, but uh, you know, you can make money off of if you're in the media by um, by uh, talking about it this way. So when I first started working uh, in this program in 2009, 2008. Um, I said, oh, I'm going to get to the bottom of this and really understand how this works. So this is where I'll give you my version of how I think this works, and uh, you guys can all um, dispute it. Um, but as I understand it, the, uh, the special committee that is set up for, um, for uh, reviewing the proposals that countries submit when they want to extend, when they want to provide scientific evidence that their continental shelf um, extends. I don't remember the exact language. Um, that, um, that committee uh, is only supposed to review the science. It's not a political committee. 
And um, if another country disputes it, then that committee's done. It's not going to actually resolve a dispute. And so essentially any kind of dispute uh, or disagreement you know, about the science is going to be resolved politically. And so once I, and if again, unless I'm dramatically wrong, once I, got to this, once I got to this level of understanding, I stopped worrying about this issue because this tells me this is going to be two or three decades, right? Because there's no, there's no motivation to resolve it right now. Uh, the geologists tell us that there's very little um, chance of, of, um, of oil and gas in these rivers. Not, they're not geological hot spots, uh, in my opinion. And so I don't see, I mean, to give you another example, um, Canada and Denmark have a border, dis have a dispute over a tiny island. They've never resolved it. There's no motivation to resolve it. There's no real conflict. The United States and, and Canada have a huge dispute over, uh, you, I'm Beaufort. sure you know all this, over the Beaufort Sea, and there actually is oil and gas under that. Yeah. They don't, they don't, you know, so that's my opinion, is that this is, this is just going to play out for a really <clears> long time, <throat> and so I don't really have to worry about it, maybe my children. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, okay. Okay. Uh, we, we have still time for one more question. Yes, I mean, I, I think um, certainly one possibility, and, and if we had slides, um, Henry could show his slide where there is a, um, a route, a shipping route that basically goes over the top of the North Pole, and that could, of course, connect um, all three of those spaces. But even now, those spaces are connected by the Northern Sea Route and um, the Northwest Passage but the levels of shipping, at least, are very limited right now. Um, and the, in terms of the different types of shipping, so far at least, it seems like the Northern Sea Route is you know, a fairly limited niche. You don't see um, a whole lot of cargo shipping uh, where speed is of the essence and timely delivery is of the essence. Um, so. I, I know you asked about the the long term, but I think at least for the foreseeable future, those shipping routes may, um, and this is purely my opinion, but it, it may be that those shipping routes are more limited in, um, in volume of, of vessel traffic and also in type of vessel traffic, just because they will not be economic or reliable for certain types of, of um, vessels or certain types of economic uses. Um, from the political view? Well, I, I think from the political view, there really is uh, no difference. And, you know, they all fall under the same regime of the law of the sea. There's, there's certain special places like the, the Bering Strait, that's an international strait, this kind of pinch point. But um, in terms of ships traveling from, from one space 
to the next. And I should mention the other, you know, important uh, difference, of course, is this the Article 234 areas where there's, you know, ice covering uh, the ocean for most of the time. That again is something that could change in the future. Um, the extent to which that article applies, but. Right now, I don't really see a difference in the Arctic, except that it is a relatively new space. It hasn't been used in the same way as the Pacific and Atlantic spaces. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but... Okay. Yes, go ahead. And there's, a, there's another interesting um, connection between those spaces that your question brought to mind, which is um, um, uh, we're discovering biological connections that haven't existed before, where ice blocked that permanent ice that I talked about, really in some ways, for some things, really isolated the Pacific from the Atlantic. So for example, I think it was 2008 or 2009, scientists in uh, eastern Canada discovered uh, a species of plankton that was a Pacific plankton, a, a species of plankton that had only been in the Pacific, you know, that we knew of, and that the uh, melting of the ice had actually probably permitted, the speculation is had permitted a migration for the first time in, I think they said 800,000 years or something, you know, some very large number. Henry always, um, who's our scientist, is always correcting me for my grandiose uh, rhetorical flourishes when it comes to these sorts of things, so. I'll take the microphone away from him. <laughs> but, um, but there's also um, my, there's also migrations uh, of Pacific salmon that they've also found, uh, that, that um, just recently, actually just uh, yeah, and again, actually Henry's co-author of this paper that I'm describing. <laughs> anyway, you see my point. It's actually another interesting uh, point about uh, connections of these spaces, um, the biological connections that may be sure. novel. As a goal, though. As a goal. Well, I'll, I won't correct Scott. He's my boss. Um, only in private. Uh, but uh, what, what's interesting to think about those, those three areas are the fact that there are also areas where the U.S., Canada, and Russia are all involved in all three. And so it's interesting, as Scott said, to think about the, the, uh, the way the relationships may differ. So if we look at the U.S., Canada, Generally, we're very large trading partners. We get along very well. And in the Arctic, we fight about the Beaufort, and we fight about whether the Northwest Passage is international waters. So some of our biggest conflicts with Canada actually happen to be in the Arctic. On the other hand, with Russia, you know, Moscow and Washington often have problems. When it comes to cooperation across the Bering Sea, we work together very well. And so in some ways, the, the Arctic space plays out differently than the, sort of the patterns that have been established for such a long time in the, in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, and so I guess the, the long-term question is, does the possibility of better cooperation in the Arctic help improve relations in the other places too? Or do our old habits of what, the way we behave in the Pacific and the Atlantic eventually just transfer themselves and erase whatever cooperation so we wind up falling into the old patterns in the Arctic too? I hope we get a chance to do things a little bit better in the Arctic and that that spreads, but we'll see. Okay, unfortunately we're coming to an end of our uh, meeting and uh, I want to thank uh, the participants and the speakers uh, and um, first of all for, for your um, interventions and presentations and your openness in, in answers. Uh, I think you, we will appreciate uh, your experience uh, uh, and uh, your eagerness to share with us your impressions on cooperation in the Arctic region. And I want to refer once again to the publication activity of Russian International Affairs Council. We do like small readers on different topics on the Arctic issue as well, like Northern Sea Route, a collection of articles. And uh, I believe by the end of the year we will have uh, a number of publications like articles and working papers. So please follow uh, our website. Thank you once again, and let's meet again mm -hmm. probably next year.